So I'm pretty excited uh, to have April Vokey with me here today, not just here to record an interview, but here in my hometown, yeah. um, doing a great benefit for our local river, for the Chattahoochee River. So thank you so much for coming out and doing that. Thank you for bringing me in. Absolutely. And uh, you taught a casting clinic out in the river today. Um, yeah. I'm curious what your first impressions were. <laughs> uh, well, the first impressions were in the field, and that was great. The field's beautiful couple of uh, small bugs, but we got around that. And then we went into the water and I saw the Chattahoochee through first-hand eyes. Could I, do you want me just to be honest yeah, about this? Yeah, please, yeah. Oh my God, it just, first of all, one of the women's like, you know, she goes, um, <laughs> you're, you're out of your mind. There's an E. coli, uh, an e. coli rating of like... <laughs> Some a, a crazy number that just... 3,900 particles per million. Yeah, and what's the, what's the number? 100 is considered dangerous. Okay, you see how that's a problem, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what people don't realize is that Lewis actually walked with me from student to student with a thing of hand sanitizer, and every single time that I finished teaching that student, he was literally like my hand sanitizer Sherpa, and he would just be standing there silent and go spurt into my hand with the hand <laughs> sanitizer. So there was that, and then there was, um, there was obviously... Um, uh, a bit of trash that went by us, which yeah. is understandable. It was a Saturday. It was a very busy Saturday with a lot of people on the river. But I think the weirdest part of the day for me was the half-eaten, quite large striper that was dead just floating downstream <laughs> with the little boy behind it just screaming like he didn't know fish existed. <laughs> That there was this fish, and we literally were trying not to catch him in our D loops. Like it was, it was a unique experience for me today, Mr. Cahill. I'm so glad I could offer you that. <laughs> I'm so, I'm so glad you were there to experience. But it, it, but you know, in looking at what the river can offer, I'd be ignorant to to say that that's what I assume the river is. Yes. Because I have spent a bit of time over the last week, really going over the river and looking at what it looks like in the headwaters and seeing the beautiful parts of it. So I understand that I got maybe not the best. You did not see it at its best. Right. Yeah, true. But I'm, I'm glad you saw what you saw. And, and I appreciate you being here to help because we're committed to cleaning it up and really appreciate your help in those efforts. You betcha. So easily you are one of the most recognizable names in fly fishing. Um, and people know you as an angler and know you as a conservationist. Um, so the first thing I want to do is I want to dive in and find a little, little background about you personally. Ooh, it's so, so exciting because so, usually it's the opposite. Where did you grow <laughs> up? What was the what was little April up to? How much time have we got? All the time you want. Yes, yeah, it's, it's so it's actually kind of refreshing being on the opposite end of the you know of, of the microphone because usually I'm asking all the questions. <laughs> yeah, I think that my upbringing was probably a little different than maybe most people realize. So I grew up in, well, I was born and raised in a city called Surrey. Have you heard of Surrey? Never. I know some of your listeners have heard of Surrey. And yes, it's the Surrey you're thinking of. So there are, um, Surrey's kind of, or was, any, now I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to say it for what it is. Surrey is the ghetto of BC, one of the ghettos of BC. Not, not maybe in the sense that Americans think of, but it's probably... The least reputable of the cities, so there's a lot of crime. Um, Surrey girls are are very famous for being promiscuous, and it's just not somewhere where you're proud to tell people in BC. So you got that going for you. So I've got that going for me. <laughs> but what it did for me, actually, you know, in all seriousness, is that I, I, I had what you would expect um, in... It was really different than, than what you would expect, Louis. So I grew up in... A rough crowd. I grew up not in a rough neighborhood. Mom and dad got us out of the rough neighborhood, so we had um, uh, we were in a good neighborhood. But I definitely hung with the wrong people. And while all of my friends were getting into gangs and getting into trouble, I had to really ask myself, "What am I doing? Is this the road I want to go down?" And so when I started, I had started fishing when I got my driver's license. That was always my escape. That was kind of when things had started to take a turn. You know, probably fifteen, sixteen. 17 and then I, I knew that I had to get out of there by the time I was 19 20 and I'd been driving out you know fishing every day I was working at I'd always worked at restaurants and I eventually worked at the casino I'd finish you know work at 4 30 in the morning I'd go straight to the river and I was spending so much time out in the country when I was 21 I bought a house and just got the hell out of Surrey just I just had to get out of Surrey 
and that was that. So, you know, like people look at it and they go, oh my God, it's so hard. And, you know, like the things that you've seen and it's not horrible. I mean, it's not like I was seeing people get shot in the face every day, but I was also, you know, occasionally hanging out in the Hells Angels clubhouse. Like it's not like we're seeing the most um, uh, best behaved people or, you know, the, the yeah. I think I'm going to leave it at that. But what I will say is that what it did was it gave me a really thick skin. And mm-hmm. that's kind of how the entrance into the industry was possible for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so we should back up for a minute just in case anyone does not know you are Canadian. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, right. surprise. So, so you're born and grew up in, in Canada, right? Yeah. And we think of Canada as, you know, Canadians being ultra polite (laughs) (laughs) civil society up there well compared to atlanta people like the people in atlanta airport yes i'm gonna say we are a civil polite people well yet the airport does not bring out the best in (laughs) you yes i don't know what i've been seeing this week yeah yeah this is this is an interesting city as well and that's not the best part of it but um so what struck me is just thinking about you being 15 or 16 and getting your driver's license and knowing being an American teenager and knowing at 15 and 16 when I got my driver's license, the kind of things I went and did. And, you know, so fishing, that's an interesting choice for um, a teenager from the city. Okay, I should back that up. Back it up way back. So, okay. How much time have we got here? As much as you want. Okay, then I'll slow it down and I'll start from the beginning. So my dad is from Newfoundland and my um, my mom is is from BC but my dad being from the Maritimes was always sharing stories with me and my sister about you know these incredible fish in the ocean mm-hmm. but my dad doesn't really fish like we trolled worms together you know he had an appreciation for some fishing but I, he, we wouldn't call him a fisherman mm-hmm. and so I just had this crazy passion for water and my parents used to take me out to Chilliwack, which is about an hour drive out of Surrey, mm-hmm. to the Chilliwack River and the Vetter River. And we would look into the water and mom and dad would turn over rocks. And they really educated me about the importance of the river and, and what it meant to the ecosystem, you know, and, and the things that lived off of the water, etc. And one day they took me there when the salmon migration was happening. And I saw this big dead Chinook salmon. And when you think of that's king for all you Americans. So, you know, when you think about a Chinook salmon, you think about it being rotten because Pacific salmon die after they spawn. Mm-hmm. So you, you'd usually think of it being this big dead rotten salmon, but this was a fresh salmon. It must have bumped its head in the canyon or something had happened and it had floated downstream. But you have to understand, I would have been, would have been about, I would have been somewhere around six or seven. And my parents explained that the river, which isn't that wide, was able to have these enormous fish pass through. And it just doesn't take long to figure out, well, if the river's only from here to there, and that fish has to go through here, if I could could intercept that fish. And so I started piecing it together, and obviously my parents were totally open to that, and they explained things. And so Dad and I did a little bit more fishing, probably more lake fishing, just trolling worms. And I had a neighbor who fished, and so... Jim would take me out on his boat and I started to catch some big rainbows and now I've got the bug. <coughs> Excuse me. So, dad buys me a brown Plano box. You know those old tackle boxes? Sure, yeah. And twice a year we got to go to um, Army and Navy. Is that mm-hmm. what it is? Which one's the clothing store? Old Navy. Old Navy, yeah. We went to Army and Navy Yeah. and I used to be able to choose two lures off the wall. And being a girl, and you have to understand my mom who is an incredible businesswoman. She's still a very feminine woman. Mm-hmm. You know, she's a strong, hard woman, but she's still very feminine. So, I was always raised in dresses and bows, and I had a, you know, I loved sparkly things, and so I would uh-huh. choose the wedding bands and the willow leaves and the things off the wall. And every couple months, I would sit down with all of my goodies and I take them all out of my box, and then I'd organize them all back in my Plano box and just would count down to when I could go and do this stuff on my own. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you're, now you know you're turning 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, you start thinking about, well, when I'm 16 and I can drive, because that's, you know, that's Mm -hmm. like the holy, you know, the holy moment when you get your driver's license. And there was a mall down the street called Surrey Place Mall. And all of my friends used to go shop there. But just down the street, there was this little shop called Gone Fishing. 
and it was a tackle store. I don't think they sold any fly gear. And so when the girls would go to the mall to buy whatever it was that they were buying, I would take my allowance and I would go buy power bait marshmallows and salmon eggs and, you know, not as many shiny things at that age, but definitely stuff to stock my box. And so before I knew it, I had this whole collection. And now I'm really excited to get my driver's <laughs> license. So I would say, so that brings me into, you know, the eighth grade, ninth grade. Things are still pretty innocent in my life, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Tenth grade. Now I'm 15 and thing, now my friends are starting to kind of go down the wrong path. So that's all starting to go down at the same time. By the time that I was 15, I was pretty excited to get that driver's license just to get away from the drug use and, you know, the promiscuity and all that stuff. So, and I had a serious boyfriend, so I never really fell into that. We were together for like, my first boyfriend and I were together for like six years. Mm-hmm. So I was able to thankfully stay out of trouble. Got my driver's license at 16 and that was it. That was it. I was gone every day. So my parents said that as long as I brought in straight A's, they didn't care if I skipped school. Right on. (laughs) So I skipped school. And because I had the lead in all the school musicals, they couldn't get rid of me. They couldn't get rid of me. They needed me. They needed you. They needed me. It was amazing. Because I was in all advanced placement classes in English, they, they, they couldn't really argue with me because I was pulling in 93s and 97% in my lit provincials and my English provincials like it was it was really really you know you look at it now and it all sounds so calculated but it was all just I just wanted to go fishing so I don't know you struck on something interesting here I don't know if you're aware that you are a difficult person to put your finger on yes right you you are full of Con- conflicts and 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 um, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> um, I don't know. But it's a little counterintuitive because on the one hand there is much about you that is still very girly, yeah. And yet on the other hand you are a hunter and an angler and have chosen to make that your life. Yeah. And you are. It's very clear just minutes into talking to you that you are a very intelligent person. Thanks. So you. You certainly don't fit into any of the stereotypes or pigeonholes. Sure. That it, right that we think of for say Surrey girls, right? Right, right. Well, I'm definitely not the epitome of a Surrey girl. Right. So yes. <laughs> you, it's interesting. I know just from a little bit of our you know hanging out and talking before that you know you took a uh, fairly circuitous route to being in the fishing industry, right? You tried out a couple of other things along the way, right? Um, well, well, let me timeline you. Okay. If, I'll timeline you. It's pretty simple. I'll, I'll just keep it brief for you. But so the drive, I start driving to the river, right? I'm skipping school. All right. I am into music, as you've heard with the musicals. So from this point here, that's 16th, 17th, seven, you know, it's the 11th and then the 12th grade and I graduate. At this point now, by the time we're graduating, my friends are bad. Mm-hmm. I've got some bad friends, especially going on into 18, 19. I decide I'm going to go to college. So I go to college for music. I go to college for music. The problem is, is you can't have the last two years of your high school life where you're constantly skipping school and then suddenly be stuck going to school again. Like, it's really hard. And I found myself, again, skipping school uh, in music. I kept skipping music to go fishing. And the profs (laughs) are cool that I had two profs who fished, and so we were able to trade off info. And I was able to finish my diploma. I didn't get my degree. I did my two years. And again, now I'm really stuck in the the fishing world. And I start wondering, should I be doing, like thinking about doing this as a career? No, obviously not. That would be a horrible idea. There's no money to be made in fishing. And and again, my friends are doing their own thing and I'm starting to, to disassociate myself, right? So that brings me to... 1920 that's where we're gonna get caught up to music Mm -hmm. so it wasn't it wasn't until I was 21 that things got really really bad and I meet a boy on the Thompson (laughs) River and uh, is this the last time we're gonna hear that story which one about meeting a boy no <laughs> no I met another one but we're married now <laughs> there's not many there's actually not many of them there's not many of them because I'm a long term relationship kind of girl but I did meet a boy and long story short together we bought a house uh, when I was 21 out in Chilliwack so I ended up all the way back so if I was going to catch you up to me to make it so it's really easy for you as the interviewer mm-hmm. I would say I had managed to escape the, that past I had a thick skin I love fishing. I was extremely independent. 
I didn't have a freaking clue what I was going to do with my life. But now I am with like-minded people and I own a house in the middle of the country. That should catch you up to my career. And this is about 21. 21. Yeah. 21. So now I start thinking, I need to make a living doing this. Like I knew that I had to make a living doing it when I was 18, 19, 20, but I didn't know how. And now let me pause you for a second. Sure. Are you fly fishing yet? I started fly fishing when I was, yeah. (coughs) Okay. Oh my God. I cannot believe I almost missed this. (laughs) Oh my God. Okay. So when I, and it's so hard to talk because this pregnant belly, it's like, do you mind if I just like, I'm going to unzip myself behind the. No, no, feel free. Oh my God, okay. (laughs) I always sound like an old asthmatic person because I just cannot breathe. When I was 17, I met a man on the river named Dave Puffer. And Dave doesn't, he didn't fly fish. He doesn't fly fish. And uh, he kept asking, every time I ran into him, he'd say, you know, I always see you out here alone. It's dangerous. Um, We should fish together. And I don't know, it was just kind of weird. He was in his 60s and I don't know, not interested. And finally, one day I realized, you know, I could probably use a fishing buddy out here. Mm -hmm. And so I agreed. And so my parents actually followed me out from the river to come and meet Dave. And he became a really good family friend of mine. But he knew I really wanted to fly fish, but I didn't have any gear. Mm -hmm. So for my 18th birthday, my present from him and the boys was I got my first eight-weight Shakespeare fly rod. Nice. And they used to tie jigs. (coughs) Excuse me. So they made me like a shoebox full of old... Um, chenille and marabou and VHS tapes mm. so I could learn how to tie flies. Nice. And that was really my entrance into fly fishing. When I was 20, so, you know, obviously I spent those years perfecting my craft, if you will, or so mm-hmm. I thought. I mm-hmm. mean, looking back now, it's hilarious because I was horrible. But watching VHS tapes, sitting on the edge of the bed, practicing with my hands. My mom and I used to go to the local lake and she was there when I learned how to double haul and we were both jumping up and down. Yeah. And, and yeah, so then I'd been fly fishing pretty seriously. When I was 21, I made my way to the Thompson. And um, still a pretty, probably tragic fly fisher, but I decided... And roughly what era are we talking about here? 2000, so I would have been 21 years old. Okay. This is exactly when I was... No, that's right, I just turned 21. I was 20. Okay. Yeah, so 18, I get the fly rod. <coughs> Excuse me, 18, I'm learning. 19, I'm totally obsessed. I'm skipping school. I'm a disaster. My parents are horrified. 20, same thing. Right after my 20th, or right after my 20th birthday. That's right, because I'm born in April. So it would have been in October. What's your birthday? April 10th. Nice. So I go to uh, the Thompson, and I'm learning how to spay fish. That's when this all went down. And I'm borrowing rods. And that was when I met, uh, well, that was basically around the same time that I met this this guy. And that was, and I only say that because what it did was it put me, um, it really, really surrounded me, me for the first time in my life by people who got me. Mm-hmm. Because I'd never had that before. Yeah. Um, like you said, it's hard to put a finger on me. How do you think my girlfriends felt? Right. You know, I was living with a friend and she was, she was a horribly promiscuous gal. She was, by the 11th grade, she slept with 52 people. Oh, wow. Yeah, she was a whore. That's impressive. And sorry. You don't have her number, do you? No, no, and you do not want her. <laughs> Good that Lord. Was a <laughs> I know. Sorry, Kathy. Uh, <laughs> Kathy is not my friend. That's your wife. That's <laughs> okay. um, <clears throat> excuse me. And so um, I used to, like, just imagine this. So I used to be, I shared a room or I shared a, a like, a, a pad with her, right? Mm-hmm. And she used to bring home guys so often and I remember one night, and this is one night of many, I was sitting on the floor cleaning my gear. Because I used to do a lot of late night sturgeon fishing, right? So I'd wait till the high slack tide and I'd go out at like 3 o'clock in the morning. And I remember one night, and I'm sorry if your children are listening, just turn it off for a second. Um, I could hear three rooms and three headboards <laughs> banging at once. And I'm in the middle of the living room cleaning my reels, just disgusted at what I'm witnessing and the lifestyle I'm, I'm surrounded by. And when those guys who were with my friends had done or whatever, they came sturgeon fishing with me. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like it was just, it was just so, and they of course disgusted me because I know these guys are gross and my girlfriends disgusted me and I just had nobody who got it. My parents didn't mm-hmm. fish, just there was nobody. And so to finally, you know, to be on the Thompson and be surrounded by the guys at the hilltop and just be surrounded by like-minded people, 
um, that was a really, that was a super important curve in my timeline. Things changed then. And then when I finally did met those people and I got the balls to buy a place in Chilliwack, uh, I really managed to get away from what I had been used to. Yeah, before good that. for you. Yeah, I think that's a pretty common story among fly of anglers. Seems that like you, it. That you find you find that tribe. Yeah. Where you fit in, you know. Yeah, and I didn't fit in. Is the problem <laughs> right? You know, like you said, it's yeah. No, I, I think I I only feel like I've started to fit in in the last few years. And we'll get there, I'm sure. But I've only started to, quote, fit in because I think with social media and the boom of all of this, just all of these people who are, I mean, it's surreal what we see online. Oh, yeah. I think only now has the industry finally said, okay, maybe she wasn't so bad to begin with. Mm-hmm. Uh, seeing what we're seeing now, maybe maybe we shouldn't have been so hard on her. Uh, but that's another story, and we can go down that road later. Yeah, we're definitely we're definitely going to go down that road for sure. <laughs> sure. So um, that's the timeline, though. Yep. So at this point, you're um, you're getting out. You're getting out of Surrey. I'm gone. You're, you're she getting, gone. You're gone. Um, you're finding yourself in fishing. How does that turn into a career? Okay, great question. So when I was spending that time in school, skipping school, my parents would say, "What are you doing?" And I was like, "Well, if I ever want to do make money at this." Because let's get real, okay? If you want to be able to do do it every day, you have to make money. Yeah. I mean, I'm not. I didn't come from a wealthy family, and nobody is spoon feeding me. I make my own money. I paid my own tuition. I pay my own rent. I am a. I take care of myself, yeah. and so I knew that to be able to fish every day because I believe in being happy. You have to make money. I mean, the thing that we haven't covered yet is my dad was. Sorry, dad. I know you hate when I say this, but my dad was a hippie. <laughs> like legit I mean he still has the afro and he was wearing bell bottoms till I was like 12 I'm picturing Bob Ross just so you know <laughs> I'm just picturing that your father is Bob Ross I mean he gets so mad when I say that but he, he that was his he was in that movement my mom who's substantially younger than my dad is a very like I mentioned hard businesswoman, and so there was this constant conflict of April you need to follow your heart because you only live once and we don't care what you do but you need to be happy but then when I would watch TV, there would always be the, what are you doing with your life? You know, you could be doing anything you wanted. I so see those two parents in you. Yeah, right? So it was a constant mm-hmm. conflict. And I never, it took me until, honestly, it, it's taken me just the last few years to be able to find balance there. It was really, really, it was really confusing. Interesting. So back to how did you find this career? Yeah, so. How did you get there? 21, I start guiding. I start Where guiding. were you guiding? I guided for a company who shall remain nameless. For two parts, largely in part because he's a dick, and secondly because um, I was I have horrible. never heard of a fly shop owner being a dick before. Oh, he was not a fly shop owner. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Let's not give him that much credit. He was a sturgeon guide owner. Oh, okay. okay. I started guiding for sturgeon. And the second part in to, in, to give him credit is I was absolutely horrible. Like, so <laughs> bad. The worst sturgeon guide you've ever seen. <laughs> So I'm fly. Okay, wait. Well, let's pause on that for a minute. Sure. What made you a bad sturgeon guy? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you for said starters, I could ask anything. <laughs> you, can, you can ask me anything. I will answer anything. To be a good sturgeon guide, you have to actually really care. And and let me just kind of backtrack. I, backtrack. I met him when I was spay fishing on the mm-hmm. lower Chilliwack, and he said, "Hey, I hear about you. You're that girl who's been, you know." Uh, you got an, a, a name that's kind of going for yourself. Not a bad name, just the, that mm-hmm. girl on the river. And I said, yeah. He said, well, I'd like, I'd like you to guide for me. And I said, well, I don't want to guide for sockeye. Because that's what a lot of those guys on the Fraser and Harrison Rivers do, is they guide mm-hmm. for sockeye and salmon and you know other salmon and sturgeon. And he said, well, what if we compromise? And I said, okay, well, how about I do some sturgeon? Because uh, I'd done a lot of sturgeon fishing off the dock. Mm-hmm. Big difference. Um... I won't do any flossing, but why don't you give me your winter steelhead trips? I would like to guide your winter steelhead trips. He said, good compromise. So, excuse me, um, sturgeon guiding was different out of a boat. I'd never run a jet boat before. I was giving my, I mean, I'm 21 years old. I've never been in a jet boat in my life, and they give me the boat two days before my first trip. What could go wrong? Well, what goes wrong is when you <laughs> tell a girl who is an idiot that you can run a jet boat in two inches of water. So this idiot here, this one... Decides that she's going to start up her boat in two inches of water. Oh. Do you know how much gravel you suck oh, up into yeah, your intake? That's in two? Not good. <laughs> no, not good. <laughs> so it started off on the wrong foot from the get go. <laughs> but you know, I stuck around for a few years, and I did. I used to do half days of guiding for sturgeon, half days of guiding for salmon. 
But I just really felt like a number. And because I wasn't a great sturgeon guide, like sturgeon guiding actually takes some talent. Mm -hmm. It does. It really does. You have to know where the fish are. You need to want to go sturgeon fishing on your day off. Mm -hmm. You need to wake up early. You know, I used to go out with my gaff in the morning, look for seagulls beside bloated salmon floating down river. Gaff them, throw them in the bow of my boat, let them just like marinate all the inside. Yeah, it sounds (laughs) delicious. My brain just wasn't there. You know, it just wasn't really there. Mm -hmm. And so... um. Yeah, where was I going with that? I was going somewhere with you. I see, I'm all disgusted. <laughs> yeah, 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 sorry. But, I'm, but what I'm interested in here is you started running winter still hit trips. Right, okay. So I get out of, okay, you wanted to know why I was bad at guiding. That's why I'm bad at guiding. Yeah, guiding. Yeah. So I start running winter still hit trips for him. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's right. Because I was such a bad guide, that's where I was going. <laughs> because I was such a bad sturgeon guide, I started carrying a, a, a kitchen in my boat, like a grill in my boat. And I started getting grief from the other guides because now I'm making them look bad. <laughs> but I had to have something to compensate because right. I was a horrible sturgeon guide. Anyway, I realized at that moment, I really, and I loved doing the winter guide, steelhead trips. I realized that I needed to break free and do my own thing. So that's what I did. So I broke free and for, you know, so I started Fly Gal in 2007 and was primarily a winter steelhead guide in the lower mainland. Right on. So at that point... When you say you started to fly gal, because when I go and look at what fly gal is today, right, you were, that was simply a guiding business at that point. Am I right? Well, yes and no. <clears throat> so how it had started was I was actually the Vossler rep. Have you heard of Vossler Reels, Mm-mm. the German reel company? Yeah, so I was the Vossler rep. And I needed, I was doing this to um, to use the company as a write-off is basically what it was. I see. Yeah, and I would had a, in my vanity, because there certainly was a lot more vanity in my younger days than there is now, I had a, a license plate that said Fly Gal, that was my, my customized vanity plate. Sure. And my, I didn't know what to call the company, and never thinking it was actually going to become public, because it was just a, a write-off company, mm-hmm. I named it, I named the company Fly Gal Ventures. And from there, uh, I started guiding for this other guy and using, uh, like I would get a commission off trips that I brought to him myself. But then I quickly realized that I didn't need him to be, you know, I didn't need to take a 15% commission when I could be taking my own clients and charging them the whole thing. So right. that's how the Fly Gal Ventures started. That's mm-hmm. how Fly Gal Ventures started. And it started for, for Winter Steelhead only after I had left the company I previously worked for. Right. But you can't really feed yourself off winter steelhead. So that's 2007. Mm-hmm. Okay, so 2007. <clears throat> and you're sure you have time for this? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, 2007. So I'm still working part-time at the casino. So I'm working at night and I'm what young. What were you doing at the casino? Cocktail waitressing all the way. Okay. So you know all that blonde hair and fake nails and all that stuff? That's right. You're blonde April at that point. Yeah, because I'm making a killing off of being blonde April in a bustier and freaking fake nails. So I'm curious, who catches more fish, blonde April or brunette April? Blonde April probably fished a little more. Yeah. <laughs> there I was you go. obsessed. I mean, I would get off the river at 4.30. I'd get off the out of the casino at 4.30 in the morning and go straight to the river. I just... I couldn't get enough. I wasn't sleeping. Yeah, to answer that, Lewis, brunette April sleeps more. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. Blonde April just didn't sleep. And, you know, I just, yeah, I was, I was, I was really, really, really busy. Mm-hmm. And so I decided in April of 2008 that I was going to quit or I was going to go down to part-time at the casino. Because I was getting really busy, mm-hmm. really, really busy with guiding and working. And, and it is, it's really hard to... to work all night at a casino and I mean yes I mean of course we're cocktailing and, and it's it sounds pretty simple but the energy gets sucked out of you the noise yeah. the lights the idiotic men the, that's a pretty hideous environment it's it was hard it was yeah. really hard so that's the, the opposite of being on a beautiful river catching wild fish totally now yeah. you know why I had to get to the river every yeah. day and so at that point there I'm just hustling I'm hustling so hard because I'm paying a mortgage I've got this brand new fancy truck and I've got a business and I'm, I've always invested and I'm investing. So I've got to make money. So I'm a hustler straight up day yep. and night. And well, on you've my, got no safety net at this point. None right? at yep. all. Yep. Not right. at all. And if I'm going to be a fishing guide, really safety net? Is yep. there such thing? No. You know, no. And so um, at this point though, I'm making some money and I mm-hmm. feel really good about it. And so I go down in April, 2008, I, I go down to part-time at the casino 
and don't claim my tips. I never claimed my tips, right? We just claimed our, our wages. A lot of waitresses do that. And in May 2000, so yeah, this is, that was in April, in May for, on May 1st, or like around the first week of May, uh, Nick Pujic, who owns, um, well now he owns VP Media House, but at the time, we were going to do this television seri- series called um, Fly Max Films, or something, mm-hmm. yeah, Fly Max Films, I think. He also owned the Canadian Fly Fisher magazine. We, we had previously met um, the year before. I didn't want to be the, you know, I didn't really want to be in the public eye. I wanted mm-hmm. to kind of be a localized person. He had bribed me to publish some photos in the magazine and told me he'd give me an underwater housing for my camera. <laughs> Excuse me. And anyway, ended up writing an article in the magazine called For the Fly Gals. My, emails, my email blew up with all of these women who were like, oh my God, please show us your way. Like, we're so scared to get into this, to help us through this. And I just started to see that my path was different than being just a cocktail server. Mm-hmm. So I went down to part-time and am I, am I keeping you here? Have I lost you yet? Go, go. Okay. And I end up driving up the end of May for lake season to go film my first episode of Flymax Films and I get in a head-on collision on my way up there. No. Yeah. So now I have no fallback. I have I've not been claiming my tips. I have no I have no income coming in and now I'm self-employed. So were you hurt seriously? Yeah. So I had a so you see my the scar on my foot? Yes. So, yeah, so I've got a completely rebuilt foot. So I've got two metatarsals in there that have maintained themselves. And the entire inside was crushed, so I had what's called a least frank fracture, which is where your joints are shattered. And my lip was knocked off my face here, and like I was just black and blue, and you know the the all the sorts of injuries you'd expect yeah. in a in a serious head-on collision. I mean, she was going 120 kilometers, I'm going 100 kilometers. We literally, she was in a three-quarter ton Chevy. We literally matched headlight for headlight. Mm. I'm towing a boat and trailer. It comes through the back. My passenger's back is broken. Her large intestine, liver, and pancreas are all detached. It all had to be sewed back in. The woman who hit us, her lungs collapsed. Her ribs were crushed. Like, it was just an absolute fucking disaster. Yeah, you're Excuse my language. Alive. Yeah, so yeah. everything changes Yeah. because of two things. One, I realize I'm alive because I'll tell you, the things that go through your head when it's dark out and all you see are two lights and you're certain you're going to die... You vow to whoever is listening, if you get me through this, I promise you, I promise I will never not appreciate my life again or live in vain because that's what I had been doing. I was so self first, like just so about myself. Mm-hmm. It was all about putting myself first. I was so career hungry to make my parents proud and to be that successful girl who had you know, done what she thought she could do that I, I didn't put anyone else first, including my family. And... Mm-hmm. I opened up my eyes the day I opened my eyes after we collided or after the vehicles collided. And wow. everything had been black and I thought I was dead, but it was just the airbag on my face. So I had that moment of like touching my body and you know, I like I moved my hands mm-hmm. down my body, my foot I, at the time I didn't realize was crushed. I go to get out of the car, I collapse. I mean it's just what you would expect. Like yeah. it's just like in the movies and a head on collision. So get to the hospital, all of this is going down. Anyway, I'll save you all the hospitalization, but end up How back in Chilliwack. In I was in the thought. hospital for a week. Yeah. Yeah, because I had a catheter for, I couldn't move. Yeah. So when I get out of the hospital, though, I am able to stay in my house for about two weeks before I go crazy. <laughs> uh, but all the, time, all the while, there's no money coming in. Sure. And I start And to, a lot going out, I imagine. Well, yeah, because I have, I mean, I'm a young mortgage owner, you know, or a homeowner, Mm -hmm. and I just bought a $52,000 truck and (laughs) probably some other things I probably shouldn't have had. And, you know, I had um, this business and no income. So from there, I sat around for a couple weeks. I started to get depressed and I don't really do depression. So it was very confusing for me Mm -hmm. to become depressed. And my physical therapist agreed that it'd be good for me to go fishing. So because we were on our way... With a crushed foot. Oh, it gets better. <laughs> <laughs> because it was lake season, all I had to do was row. So he made me wait until I could have fun- you know, functional use of my arms and my torso again. My torso was extremely beat up. Yeah. Like I couldn't move. And it's really hard. You ever tried living in the house in a wheelchair by yourself? No. Because that boyfriend... I, I, I hope not to. <laughs> well, that boyfriend became an ex for a reason. I mean, he just went north anyway. 
he was gone anyway and left me in the house. I was literally injecting my stomach wow. with, to make sure I wasn't blood clotting and wheeling my... One time I got stuck in the kitchen between the fridge and the doorway and I just couldn't get out. My sister had to come and get me. Like, it was pretty awful. So um, the physical therapist agreed we should probably get me out of there. So, yeah. <coughs> excuse me, one of the guys drove me north to where the other guys were lake fishing and we proceeded to film as planned. No way. Out of a wheelchair. Yeah, it's really cool to look back in the episode because you'll see me wheeling down in the wheelchair, you know, and I've got my, my crutches wherever they fit. I'm sorry, that's hardcore. It was, <laughs> it was desperate, just desperate. I had to get out of that house. And um, I know I always get a kick out of it. There's this god-awful photo on the internet, and it's the one where I've got, I'm like bending down, I'm wearing a halter top, and it looks like I have some cleavage, and my hair is blowing in the wind. and It looks, <laughs> it looks like it's this really like post-sexual shot. Here's what people don't know. On our way back down after filming for six weeks in the interior mm -hmm. lake fishing, I finally was on crutches at this point. And my ex and I, we decided on the way home, we were going to fish the Thompson River for trout. Now, have you ever stepped foot in the Thompson? I have not. It's pretty slippery. Yeah. And I thought, being you know the idiot that I was, I'm going to fish this river on crutches. On crutches. And I did. And guess what? <laughs> I caught a fish on crutch. And that picture, the reason why I've got the shit-eating grin is I'm on crutches. And I, the crutches are floating downstream. Oh, no. But I'm on crutches, man. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> so that's why it's disappointing when, you know, you hear the stereotypes behind of don't ever judge a right. book by, a cover, by its cover. Right. Okay, so that puts us into 2008. Yeah. So the second reason why it was so important with that accident is now I realized either I'm going to go hard or go home in this industry. Mm -hmm. What am I doing with myself? Because the casino wouldn't take me back. Mm -hmm. Because I'm now, I'm now, I am still clinically disabled. Yeah. So now she's clinically disabled, and if she hurts herself in the casino, it's Make on us. Your liability mm -hmm. to them. Yeah. So I dive into I dive into it, but I need to dive into it a little differently now. I need to. I'm still on crutches for quite some time, mm -hmm. so I need to focus on my writing, my commercial fly time. So I sit down and I write uh, out an Excel sheet. It's like, how much money do I need to make in this industry? And I still advise people do this if you're wondering how to get into this and make some money. How much money do I need just to survive? Okay, well, for me, I have a mortgage and all my other expenses and my investments, and I, con I consider that survival. I need to have, you know, a, um, food, mm -hmm. fuel, all of these things, but it really wasn't that much money. It was like 30 grand. It really wasn't that much money that I needed at the time to live annually. And I put together an Excel sheet, and it was like, okay, well, what are my areas of revenue? All right, so I've got, at this point, I had fly gal merchandise. I had commercial flies or flies that I was tying. Mm -hmm. I had some workshops, um, not so many back then. I wasn't, I didn't, wasn't certified then. I wasn't teaching that often, but I was teaching fly tying. <coughs> Excuse me. I had writing. I had guiding. I had booking commissions. So I set, put together with my accountant a an auto Excel sheet so that whenever I would plug in the quantity, it would give me the number that I, uh, the amount of money I'd be making. So I'd go, okay, well, if I want to make my 30 grand a year, mm -hmm. as we all laugh out loud, <laughs> I need to sell, you know, two t-shirts this month and this amount of, um, you know, workshops or this amount of articles. And it was uh, like a, an appallingly low, low number. Mm -hmm. So very quickly I was going, well, let's try for 50 grand. And, you know, it's, well, let's try for, let, let's try for, let's see what the limit is that we can do. And as mm -hmm. long as I budgeted my month and was organized, I was able to make the money I had always, always been told I couldn't make. And that, of course, took more than just a few years, but that's kind of yeah. where, where we're at today. So that all became possible because of that car accident. Which is crazy. I think it's a glass half full thing, you know, and, yeah. and I never took for granted my relationships again. Yeah. You know, you're going to ask me at some point, and you told me you're going to ask me, and I'm going to throw you under the bus here. Yeah, go ahead. You said to me, you know, how do you, and we can go down that road later, but you said, how do you ask, how do you ask questions you do in your podcast? Yeah, I'm, now I am really interested. You know what? I'm going to, you go ahead and say what you're thinking, but we're getting back to that in a second. Sure, you section. bet. And the answer, honestly, Lewis, I was thinking about it. It's just that I'm genuinely interested. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm so far past myself. But don't get me wrong, it's kind of, I can even feel myself kind of shaking finally being able to tell my story. Like, it's refreshing sometimes, but I'm so far being just about myself um, that I can actually focus on other people. 
And that never would have happened if I didn't have that car accident. Yeah. I really think that if I had stayed down the path that I was on without that car accident, without the awakening, I think I, I think I would have been a totally different personality than I am today. Yeah. Yeah. So that was really your, your introduction to the media because you were, you were unable to fish. Oh, yeah. So you had to write. Right. Right. So that was really how you got into the fly fishing media. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You're right. Um, because I think you have done a phenomenal job of that. Thanks. Right. Like, and having been on the other side of the microphone and been interviewed by you, I was stunned by what a great interviewer you are. And I'm kind of a little, I'm kind of a little geeky about that. Like I'm a fresh air listener because I love Terry Gross's interviews and I, I, I like the, I like getting in depth with people and getting under the skin. So yeah, I'm, I get that you are a very sincere, engaging person. And the, the, the folks listening to this don't know, but you were recording a podcast down here before we did this. And I was upstairs with some friends, and my friend Scott made that comment. He said, you know, that girl, when you talk to her, is one of the most engaging people Aww. I've ever met. She really listens. Oh, I re- that means a lot to me. Thank and, you. Right. And, and you get that. Um, but your, your interviewing technique... Just, it, it seems to go beyond that. So you, certainly you must have studied it. You must have done something to learn to interview people in the way you do. Not a thing. <laughs> Is there a way to study it? I, I, you know, maybe listening to other people or I don't know, but I'm, I'm asking you because I'm not a good interviewer. You are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, I think you're very engaging. Um, I honestly don't have an answer for you. The only, I had actually thought long and hard about it and the only answer I had for you was that I'm just genuinely interested. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, all I've got. I was I was impressed by it, and Thank um, you. and I think you ask really great questions, and your podcasts are are really riveting, and I've I've listened to many of them, and I have some personal favorites, but I'm curious um, what some of your favorites are. Who are the favorite people you've interviewed? <gasps> well, your ape story is right up there. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and I'm not just saying that because we're here right now. Um, I I obviously have a soft spot for the Joan Wolf one. Yeah, me too. Because that was just such a dream come true. Mm-hmm. And um, John McMillan's really gets me because he, like we were talking about, mm-hmm. you know, sincere people who genuinely are what they appear to be. Yeah. He is so, his inte- he is, he is so fish first. It's mm-hmm. incredible. Um, so definitely John McMillan and probably Jerry French is right up there. Okay. Yeah. Well, your, your one and two are my two favorites. Which ones? That Joan Wolf and John McMillan. Oh, were. good. Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> good. absolutely. And and so I'm fascinated. I'm going to put you on the spot now because sure. I realized listening to that interview um, between you and Joan, um, and I've said this to several people. I'm now going to say it to you that I kind of feel like you are our generation's Joan Wolf. I see a lot of similarities between the two of you, and, and I wonder if you see any of that. You know, I probably saw more than I did. Um, I probably saw more similarities. Before I did the podcast. Then after I did the podcast, I think I probably saw less. And I'll explain, because yeah, that's please. probably a little bit interesting. Please. And just to backtrack, the other thing, just about the introduction to the media, a huge part of the timeline that we're probably missing there is, as far as introduction to the media, it was also the same time Facebook came out. Right. And yes. it was when blogs, I mean, remember being like, what's a blog? A what? Yes. I mean, it just sounded like Yes, something. I do. Yeah. So that not was long all... before I found myself running one. Exactly. Welcome <laughs> to the club, and that will also that will segue me into this stuff with Joan. So, with I had thought that Joan was going to be maybe a bit more of a headstrong personality. Like I remember when I did that sixty minutes piece piece because I curse like a sailor, <laughs> and I can't help myself. And uh, I received an email from Joan, and she said, you know, this is before I had met her in person. She said, you're a talented, intelligent woman, you do not need to speak like that. We could just have a whole different podcast on that. I could read, sure. give you quotes off seven different, you know, Harvard papers about actually how it doesn't mean that you're any less intelligent because you use sure. profanity. There's actually a lot of reasons. But, I'm worse than you, so okay. yeah. <laughs> so, but moving forward on that, um, I just remember feeling like we are just such different people, which we are. And Joan is so classy and so quick to bite her tongue. And I don't have that, whether it be maturity, talent, or class, I haven't decided. 
but I don't have either of those three things going for me. Well, that's not entirely true, but I, I, I have a harder time biting my tongue than Joan does. And I'm sure a lot of it's just a generational thing. Sure. She definitely grew up in a different time than we did. I would say that what we have in common is our dedication to truly being the best we can be. I would say that we probably both have somewhat of a natural athletic ability. I can only ever aspire to be half as talented as Joan is. I really, I can honestly say that. Um, I'm trying. I'm just, yeah. I'm, I don't know if I'll ever get there. Uh, she's kind of a freak of nature in she's her own a right. You know, woman. she's unbelievable. She's my hero. <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, but the way that we've gone about our careers is very, very different. Mm-hmm. You know, like if you look at Joan and. And she's the first person to say this in the interview. You know, she she met a man, and there was a lot of that in her era. There was a lot of, like, in, you know, she obviously had her career s- settled mm-hmm. before she ever met her husband. Mm-hmm. And that's very clear in the podcast. You have to listen to her story. She was very much what a settled, story, huh? unbelievable yeah. in the industry before she ever met, way before she ever met her husband. Um, but she definitely landed in, she landed in the right spot. And I'm not saying I haven't yet. I'm my husband's great, and he's really supportive. But I still there's still that element of feeling a little bit alone. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. Charles is great. He's wonderful, and he understands the industry. And he definitely walks me. In, you know, he walk he walks with me down the path. But at the end of the day, we're not like we're not Joan and Lee Wolf. Mm-hmm. It's right. April Vokey and. Charles Barrett. Who's Charles Barrett? She's, he's the Aussie bloke she married. You know, I, I just sometimes I feel really alone. Um, so I, and, and I think I've been a lot more aggressive in my career than she ever was. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what the parallels are in your eyes. I guess I guess what you, I guess if I had to if I had to imagine where you're going with that, mm-hmm. it would be maybe a public perception. Well, Joan certainly was in the media a, a great deal, hugely as as you have been. Right. Um, was certainly a gifted um, angler and technician. As you are. Thank you. Right. And certainly a gifted educator as you are. Huge, huge. Right. So, so I kind, I guess that, and we might, this is as good a time as any, I guess, to talk about the elephant in the room. Sure. You're a very attractive woman, as is Joan Wolfe. Right. Right. And there are benefits and liabilities that come with that. I see where you're going with this. I do. Right. And so I think the two of you wrestled with some similar things. We, we would have. Yeah. yeah. We would have. I think um, a large part of the, the wrestling, she didn't have to hear about because there was no social media. She didn't yes. have to get the hate emails. I mean, to have to tell her how yeah. much you hate her, you had to write her a letter, which most people didn't do because there was, mm-hmm. an, uh, there was an element of class back then that just doesn't exist today. Right. So I think that any hate r- hatred that Joan had, because she did have it, let's get real about this, mm-hmm. uh, she didn't hear and it wasn't necessarily... In the public, uh, that's my assumption. I didn't live back then, mm-hmm. but in speaking to her, even off the record, it sounded like there. You know, she knew there was the hate, and she would walk into the room and she would feel it. But she didn't have to read a hundred comments of it behind, you know, beside every photo of her. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, with me, there was definitely a lot of that. But back to the public perception thing, I've simply stopped looking. Uh huh. I just don't have the energy to read it anymore. So I don't really know what the public persona or what the public perception is. Of me and, and how it might relate or you know um, parallel with Joan in their eyes. Yeah, right, eyes. sure. And I, and I don't know that any of us want to know what our public perception is really, right? But the, <coughs> and that brings me to another point that's really intriguing to me is the advent of social media. Right. And so you know you got dragged headlong into that um, as, as as so many people did. I dragged myself into it at first. Yeah. At first. Innocently. <laughs> it's just simple. You know, there was this marketing tool. Yeah, yeah right. Yep. And I was hated. Imagine this. This is back first year of Facebook. Mm-hmm. And that Facebook existed. And I had put pictures up of myself to let people know who I am to come and be guided by me. Right. And that was a huge no-no. Like back then, it was that was a huge no-no. You were considered a, um, a self, what was that? A self-promoter. Yeah, right. A self-promoter. And, you know, I look now and I laugh at these same people who gave me so much shit and they've got, they've got 10 times more accounts than I do. You, you know, know what I mean? It's just crazy. Well, can we just dispel the idea that there's anything wrong with self-promotion? Self-promotion is how anyone gets anywhere, what right? If, so if you're in business and you're making a living and there's nothing wrong with that, if you're not promoting yourself, you're not going to make a living very long. But so. it depends what you use it for. 
Yes. You know what I mean? Like, obviously, we ultimately want to eat. Like, that's what a lot of this comes down to. We would like to eat. Mm -hmm. um, and eat while doing something that we love to do. And there's nothing wrong with that. Where I have a problem, because I can't, honestly, I cannot authentically look at you in the eye right now and mm -hmm. say that I'm totally cool with what's going on in social media. Okay, we're going to get to that in a second. Okay. Because right. that's a conversation I want to have. But before that, I have a question I want to ask you that's been on my mind for a while. Go for it. Um, so I think there are a lot of great people in fly fishing. And unfortunately, with the reach of the internet and the anonymity <coughs> that the internet allows people, um, people are those who aren't necessarily so great are allowed to be their absolute worst. And I feel like more than anyone else I'm aware of, you have taken the brunt of that. At every angle, you are criticized um, for anything that you take a stand for. Uh, you are criticized for being attractive. On the other hand, you have suffered just an ungodly torrent of sexual innuendo and, you know, trollishness over that. And the thing that amazes me is that you are always so gracious. You handle that so gracefully. Sometimes. And, and I <laughs> don't, you. I don't know where that comes from. What, what is your mindset? I don't know if it's gracefully because I definitely have had low times where I've probably been too harsh in a response and in saying that just by responding at all. Um, you know, I understand what I look like from the outside to people. I get it. It's hard not to judge a book by its cover. Mm -hmm. When I'm at ICAST and I see a hot blonde in tight clothing walk by me with her <laughs> boobs pushed up to her chin, I'm going to be honest. I mean, first thing I do, so just so that you guys don't feel bad, the first thing I do is check out her ass. <laughs> Sorry, it's natural. Yeah. And yeah. the second thing I do is immediately discredit that she could possibly be legit because she's so focused on selling something else. Right. Yeah. Then I have to ask myself, did she just finish cocktailing? Mm -hmm. What is her story? And then there's usually a story, whether it be that she's exactly what we, you know, maybe she's a stereotype or maybe she's yeah. not. Yeah. But I battle with that initial first, you know, first thought or, or first impression. That's normal. I think the difference is I don't immediately post it on the internet mm -hmm. or or vocalize my my first impression. I actually take a moment to, before I go and say, you are X, Y, and Z, I take a moment to actually learn a little bit about her first. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's hard for me to get too upset at the people who have judged me because I get it. I did a lot of it to myself. You know, I did a lot of it to myself, and I did a lot of it by not saying no to the companies who wanted to use me. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I could. Everyone says to you when you get in this industry, it's a tiny industry. Don't piss anyone off. It's a tiny industry. So I was scared to say, no, you can't use that. Or, no, take that off. Or, mm -hmm. no, you don't have access to that photograph. And um, so that was part of my fault there. And then the other part, you know, partly my fault is it took me a long time to have a voice. And it wasn't really till the podcast, mm -hmm. that, which is like two years ago. I mean, let's get real. I'm 34 now. I've been doing this, you know, since you've heard the timeline now. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty sad that it wasn't until two years ago that people started maybe, maybe, I'm assuming, I'm hoping, starting to take me seriously. But I have to also be a realist, you know, I've got to be realistic and say, well, that's also because they heard me speak. Mm -hmm. How could they possibly know everything? They don't have 25 hours to dive into my history. Of course they're going to assume that I'm like the stereotype. That's not their fault. Mm -hmm. so it's their own education. So, you know, I get it. I'm not upset by it. And have I always been graceful or gracious about it? Certainly not. I'm, I have a horrible temper and a trucker mouth. Um, but I'm just thankful. I'm just thankful to today, finally, to have found my happy point where I feel like I can at least be heard. That's why the podcast is so great because nobody yeah. can see me. Yeah. They're not listening because they're curious. I mean, <coughs> this is how you know it's bad. Somebody posts a video of, of me. I'm not, I was going to say uh, you or me, but let's get real of me. Yeah, nobody posts videos of me. <laughs> well, no, they do, but let, it just let me get the context going. You know, a, a video of me tying a fly and they're focusing on the fly. But in the background, you can see my face. But with you, they just see a goatee. Mm -hmm. Nobody thinks anything of it, right? Mm -hmm. But with me... Oh, they're zoom. They're look. They're, they're trying to show her mouth. They're selling sex. Well, actually, they're selling a fly, but you're seeing my mouth and you're seeing mm -hmm. sex. So, you know, there's a whole lot of. There's just been a whole lot of media that just has not worked out for me, and it's yeah, not necessarily yeah. anyone's fault. 
So it's really nice to have podcasts where there's none of that. Yeah. There's none of that. It's just you listening to my voice. I never thought of that, but it makes perfect sense. Yeah. It's really, I feel liberated. And I finally, for the first time, right, wrong, or otherwise, but for the first time in my career, I finally feel like I have a little bit of respect. <laughs> I think you have more respect than you than you recognize. Thank you. I guess by the time I stopped looking to see what people thought about me, because there was yeah. a time when I actually looked. Sure, yeah. I guess by the time it broke my knees... Maybe it started to neutralize or maybe it started to filter out. But at that point, I just stopped looking. So I don't know what the public thinks of me these days. It's none of my business, honestly. Yeah. So any regrets? Was there anything you do differently? You know, yeah, of course there is. I love that question because people are always like, you know, any regrets? And <coughs> I actually haven't answered that question yet. Let me think about it. But, you know, I'd like to say, oh, no, everything's part of a life's lesson and a learning experience, which I'm sure it is. But, um my regrets are that I didn't know back then about photos on the internet. Yeah. You know, because that was still kind of new. The internet was there, but I didn't know if you put a photo up on Facebook once that you'd never get it off. Mm -hmm. um, especially now, you know, having children and stuff. You want to have yeah. it. And, yeah. No. Um, I, I never regret my appearance because that is who I was. That's who I am. I'm a naturally mm -hmm. feminine woman. I'm sorry that you don't like... Actually, I really don't give a shit that you don't like it. <laughs> I, just, I just am what I am and have, I've always had a reason for looking, whether I be blonde, red hair, or brunette. I've always... Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's not even relevant. Um, I regret calling my company Fly Gal, mm. but, you know, on the opposite side of things, there's... It's introduced me to a lot of excellent ladies who or women who would never have thought to contact me. Do I have any regrets? <laughs> wow. No. Good answer. Well, I think the, you you struck on a point there that I think is important and that I know you've taken a lot of criticism, particularly from men in the industry, but I think you've also been a really great role model for a lot of young women I in, hope so, in the Chris. industry. I hope so. Um, do, you, do you feel a responsibility? Yes. There? Oh my God, I'm sorry. I'm so excited that you just asked me this question. <laughs> Let me walk you through this. Okay. Um, so I podcast with Adrian Camo, mm -hmm. who's my best friend. Very hard podcast because we're so close. And we started talking about the industry today and just how different it is. Because mm -hmm. in our day, you had to go to the clubs and speak at the clubs and write and present and have talent. You couldn't just post a photo on Instagram and, and blow up. And you ever notice that nowadays they, they, they say to you, you know, well, who's so-and-so? And the first description of that person is, well, he or she has X amount of thousand followers. Right, yes. Is that really how we're describing people these days? Maybe is there... Kim Jong-un or... What? Yeah. <laughs> right, but is our success gauged by right. followers? Half of yeah. which the accounts are purchasing their followers? Is this really, really where we're at? So mm -hmm. Adrian and I went off on a, tang on a tangent. And when I published her podcast, her and I got on the phone. And anyway, long story short, Charles looks at me and he goes, why do you care? Which is a totally valid question. And I love that he mm -hmm. challenges me. And I, why do I care? And I had to explain. I remember one day driving with a fishing buddy and saying to him, this is before Instagram existed. It was actually my ex-boyfriend. We were driving and I said to him, because I had been, I had entered the industry at that point and I was getting my knees pretty broken by the industry. <laughs> you guys were horrible to me. You were awful. <laughs> anyway, that's <laughs> all right. You've made, since made up for it. But yeah, and I said to him, you know, it's worth it. And I had that thick skin from Surrey. And I said, it's worth it because these girls one day will see the mistakes that I made and they will not make them. I don't regret them, but I'm not saying they were right. Mistakes, you know, putting myself first before the car accident, images that maybe shouldn't have been up on the internet. Um you know, I, I, and let's be honest, I'm talking about the one where I'm holding the trout with my tongue out, which, by the way, I was kidding around, not ever realized, like, right. I am perverted, don't get me wrong, but there, I didn't mean to be perverted in that particular photo. But, yeah, so I'm saying, you know, I've made mistakes, and I hope that these girls learn from my mistakes. Mm -hmm. So at least I've got that going for me, and that inspired me to stay really true to myself and, and just keep, you know, full steam ahead in the industry. And so that would have been, you know, years ago, years ago. So when Charles said to me, why do you care? I looked him in dead in the face and I said, because 
for so long, I thought that I was putting all of this work and commitment into this industry for these ladies or for these girls, let's get real, <laughs> these girls, because I thought I was doing a little bit of like groundbreaking stuff, like paving the path for them to follow. And they're just so vainly going down their own trail. Mm -hmm. And he had to look me in the eye and say, it's really not your problem. But for the first time in all these years, I had to actually you know, come face to face with the fact that they really are not my responsibility. Right. And I did feel a little bit, just like Joan getting back, you know, emailing me and saying, you don't need to speak like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe she felt that same sort of responsibility for, for me. And I feel that responsibility for them. So when I see them making these horrible mistakes that are going to plague them and they don't have to make the, these errors, it, yeah, I take it a little personal. So sure. let's get cut right to the chase on that. Cut when to it, it. When it comes to guiding, <clears throat> dealing with people in the industry, traditional media, social media, do you have any advice for young women trying to get into the fly fishing industry? Of course I do. My advice is stay true to yourself and learn to say no. A lot. <laughs> a lot. You know, even if it makes you look difficult to work with, say no. Don't do anything that doesn't feel right in your gut. If taking a certain photograph feels right to you, then fine, by all means, go for it. But if you know in your stomach that you shouldn't either be on a fishery or be posing uh, in a certain way or be wearing something or just something that just doesn't, doesn't feel right to you, say no. My second bit of advice is... <laughs> This really gets me going. And this is man or this is not gender specific. If you're going to deem or if you're going to gauge your own success by having a following, it is, I'm going to just be totally straight here, disgusting to me to do that without having some sort of a voice. If the whole point to have people following you is so that you have eyes and you're doing it because you want sponsors to give you free stuff for a paycheck, that is wrong. I get it, it's part of it, don't get me wrong, I play the game too. I also have to have a following so that sponsors say, have you seen April Vokey, she has 75,000 followers. I really don't give a shit about having 75,000 followers, but they do. Mm -hmm. But I can sleep at night because I know that those 75,000 followers and those 150,000 eyes are possibly listening to a message that I have that's for the greater good. Right. And that lets me sleep at night. And if you don't focus on doing something good or giving something back, then I think you're just into it for the wrong reasons and I cannot respect that. And I just have no time for it. So that brings me to another great point. Sure. We'll get, get off to another topic now. <laughs> um, because when I think about you and your voice, I immediately think about conservation. Good. When did... Um, you start to feel that that was an important thing to you? When did you start to find yourself as a conservationist? Uh, my car accident. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, it was, it was, that was the time. So that was like when everything, everything changed. So I was in my wheelchair mm -hmm. and was feeling pretty down and out and really high on Percocet or uh, mm -hmm. oxycodone is what it was. <clears throat> and, um, I had this voice in my head, this sounds really crazy, but I had this voice and it said, if you could get $1 from everybody who follows you, here we are back to social, mm -hmm. $1 for everybody who follows you on Facebook, because that's all that there was back then, think about the difference that you could make for this, for the Thompson River, because mm -hmm. they were doing a bunch of habitat restoration in the Spies Creek system. And I thought, that's interesting. And I thanked the voice, which of course I thought was God, because I had just begged God to let me live and I promised him that <laughs> I would do anything he said. So when I heard that voice, I'm listening. So I uh, started to think about how I could ask everybody for a dollar. But have you ever tried asking everybody for a dollar? <laughs> no, but I know a guy on the street that does. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Not happening. So I thought, what if I asked everybody for a fly? Mm -hmm. One fly. <coughs> Excuse me. And so I did. And the flies flooded in. They came oh, that's brilliant! Pouring in, so I started this this um, fundraiser called Flies for Fins, and a graphic designer donated you know their the design of the Flies for Fins logo, and the flies flooded in. So what I was doing is for uh, for several years, I would take these flies and then I'd post them on Facebook, and I would even do like because bigger items started coming in, so I would do like um like auctions on the comments. So I'd be like, okay, so if you you know. Time shuts down at 11 o'clock p.m., you know, 
uh, Pacific Standard Time, place your bid. And so then people would then send me their money in a check. And then I would go ahead and send them whatever item that they had won. Or, and or eventually I started, I started a Flies for Friends website and was posting all the flies. But it is so much work yeah. posting individual pictures of flies. Yeah. Um, anyway, so the first year I did that, I made $25,000 for, for Spies Creek. Wow. Pretty cool. Amazing. Yeah, so I started working with the Steelhead Society of British Columbia. And admittedly, I haven't been able to be as active these days because now that I'm in northern BC, I do more work with the northern, uh, the northern nonprofits. Wow. But that was really, I, I started to watch how they handle things and I really opened my eyes to how good it made me feel. And then as I started, remember I told you I started making money mm-hmm. and that made me happy, but it didn't make me happy. You know what I mean? And yeah. uh, the only thing I've tried everything and, and you know, I, I have everything. So I'm making money, travel, all these things. I have the career, you know, dreams are made of. But the only thing that truly makes me happy that I can lay my head down at night with is giving back and actually knowing that I'm making a contribution. So it's really it's a it's selfish. It's a high for me. I get high off of it. Yeah. yeah. So what are your what are your favorite causes right now? That's a really good question because I feel really fraudulent right now because you know I've I've been so involved over the years with certain projects all in British Columbia. Mm-hmm. And then for people who've never heard of me before, uh, who are trying desperately to keep track of this crazy timeline, we've missed 10 years of it because we just don't have 20 (laughs) hours. Um, But four years ago, I met a man who's become my husband. So I moved to Australia three years ago, Mm -hmm. part-time. All of these people who think I live full-time in Australia, can we please clarify I live part-time in BC, (laughs) part-time in Australia. Um, So my attention has been pulled. So what happens every year is, I basically disappear for um, the winter months in North America. Mm -hmm. And then when I arrive, which is on Tuesday, I'll be back in my Northern Hemisphere time, I basically get immediately sucked into all of these things that I need to help do to raise media awareness Mm -hmm. or funding, um, et cetera, et cetera, in the Northern BC region. So I'm in a weird layover time where I'm not really doing much in Australia and I'm not really doing much in BC because I'm on my way to BC. Right. If you ask me in a week after I'm sure I've had 25 people in my ear, I'll have a much clearer focus. But last time, uh, so last year when I was up there, we were focused on the LNG mm-hmm. issue. And then there was a bunch of political uproar when Trudeau came in and now I've got to get back up to speak so, with Shannon. So for the American yeah. <laughs> listeners, break that down for just briefly. Liquid natural gas plants, um, they wanted to come in and do this enormous operation on Lilu Island, which is, of course, um, the head, it's, the, um, it's the estuary, the Skeena River, got all of our turtle grass, all of our juvenile um, salmon species, steelhead species. They need that as rearing area, and it basically has the potential to be completely wiped out if this operation goes through. I can't really speak on much more about that because mm-hmm. the next step of that goes so political. Yeah. Uh, what I will say is if it's something that interests you, and I hope it does, the Shannon McVeil podcast really dives into mm-hmm. it. I will do a follow-up publicly in the next few months after I know where we're at. Right. Um, my biggest success would probably have been when we beat Shell out of the sacred headwaters. And <laughs> just to kind of give some ideas on how that goes because... A lot of people don't know what they can do mm-hmm. uh, when they, they feel helpless, kind of like how I'm sure some of you feel in the Chattahoochee. Absolutely. We had Shell come in and they wanted to do a bunch of fracking and drill upwards of 10,000 wells in the sacred headwaters, which is um, like one of BC's most, I think it was at the time, BC's most endangered river system. And it's the birthplace of the Skeena, Stikina, and the NAS system. And Shell wanted to come in and just basically devastate it. And I'd had a meeting with Shannon McPhail, who's from a very, very small town up north. And she got me really riled up, as she does, Mm -hmm. which you'll hear on the podcast if you listen to the one with Shannon. And uh, I decided I was going to write an article about it in Fly Fusion magazine. So I had Yvonne Trenard write an opening, an opener to it. And I think this was in 2011, somewhere along that timeline. No. Yeah, no, because we beat them in 2012. Wow, time's going by fast. Oh, my God. Um, And then also David Suzuki wrote an opening. And um, I decided I was going to, again, use a voice and risk people hating me because I was pretty used to it at that point (laughs) in time. And, (coughs) excuse me, do a tell-all about what was going on up there. And the article just was, it received so many 
letters of hate because it was true. Mm-hmm. And it, the people in Alberta felt like it was a direct hit on them, which um, I suppose in some ways it probably was. And anyway, I, from there it just turned into chaos. I was on the radio station, uh, just using all the media awareness I possibly could. Uh, obviously, I'm not getting the the scientific data, but I'm working close. I was working closely with them. And long story short, we won. Yeah. We won. And after I had that sort of encouragement within, you know, just within myself, seeing that that could happen, that we could beat Shell, it's been a it's been a long uphill battle since then, just taking on projects, but one project at a time and trying to beat it before moving on to the next. I think that we get so inundated on social media with problems that we tend to spread ourselves too thin. And we think that if we do one Facebook post that it's like actually doing something, <laughs> you know, you've got to do more than just do one Facebook post. Yeah. yeah. So if I'm a, a listener listening to this interview and I'm thinking, man, that's an impressive story. I want to get involved in some conservation project. What's your best <laughs> advice? Okay. First of all, find out which one. Mm-hmm. Find out which one. And don't get distracted by the other 10 issues that are happening. Focus on one. Give it all you have. Either win it or lose it. Because if you win it, excellent, you're inspired to move on to the next. If you lose it, you're just one step closer to winning your next one because you're not going to win them all. That's just the reality. Sign up to become a 1% for the Planet member. That was one of the best things I ever did. Uh, if for nothing else, I can sleep at night. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, you know, donating money helps. Donate your money silently. Like, you know, you don't need to publicly promote that you're donating all of your money. So there's that. Um, and then if you don't have your money, if you don't have the money, but you have the time, or you have just a little bit of time, just reach out to the organization who you believe in is doing the most and ask what you can do because there's always something. We don't all we don't all have hundreds of thousands of followers to use a voice with, and we don't all have all have money. But we do, and we don't even all have time. But if you care, you should be able to take two hours a month to do something to yeah. help out. Yeah. Yeah. So. We talked a little bit about your um, living in Australia, mm-hmm. and we've talked a good bit about your past. Let's talk about the present. Right now, um, let's have a, a snapshot of, of what's April Vokey's life like. What irons have you got in the fire? <laughs> uh, well, I've got a bun in the oven fire. Uh, yes, you do. That's changing everything. So, yeah, so it's a really strange time to ask me that because mm-hmm. I don't have a clue. I, in my usual life, where I'm usually committing myself to way too many things and not sleeping enough and just working too hard. Excuse me, it has been changing. I'm saying no to opportunities in the next few months. You know, I'm Mm -hmm. sleeping more. So my life is very different today as we sit here than it has been in other years. So I can't actually give you a definitive answer on where my life is going. What I will say is that I'm determined to try to maintain some sort of normalcy with the baby in the next few years but yeah. everybody who has children is laughing at me right now at home they're like ha, 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 ha. silly girl <laughs> silly girl but you know I'm determined to show um, myself my husband my child and others by you know um, people who would like to become parents that you can I think I believe I hope uh, not entirely you know completely lose yourself you can still maintain your career my mom did my mom maintained her career and I called her crying when I realized that this might be harder than I thought. And, uh, and she, she told me I was being silly and she said, you know, you didn't slow me down. And she's just as crazy as I am. She's just as ambitious as I am. So I believe my mom, I'll be listening to my mom's advice on that. I'm very happy for you, um, having a baby. And I'll tell you, I think that's going to be a very fortunate baby and you owe it to that child not to lose yourself because you're going to make a great human being in this world. Bang on. Thank you. So you, aside from being an expectant mom, mm-hmm. you travel a great deal. Yes. You're all over the world fishing. In fact, you had to cancel some trips because of Zika virus when you mm-hmm. found out you were pregnant. How many days a year do you spend on the road? <sighs> so many. I'm yeah. trying to think like too many yeah, too, too many. many. <laughs> I'm at the stage, and this is going to sound unappreciative, and please don't take it that way, mm-hmm. but I am honestly at the stage where nothing sounds good anymore. Sure. Yeah. No beach, no margarita, no fishery 
is sounding mm-hmm. that exciting. Mm-hmm. What sounds exciting to me is being on my property in BC, cutting wood, hunting grouse, yep. fishing my piece of water, and jar like making jam. And that's not me becoming domesticated. I'm just, I'm tired. You know, travel is really exhausting. It's really yeah. exhausting. I'm sure. I'll, I mean, I'll still be doing lots of travel. It is my life, but. How much travel have I been doing? Enough for me to not want to be doing it anymore. Right, exactly. Yeah. And you run two companies? Is it three? <laughs> Where am I at now? So, <laughs> oh man. Um, nowadays, with the Rod stuff kind of all fi- being wrapped up now, long story, another day. Um, two. Okay. Two companies. So can you tell us a little bit about your swimsuit company? Sure. It's a strange one. So don't tune out now. Don't just hang on. No judging the book by the cover. Um I was contacted by a friend of mine who wanted to start a bikini company. And because I am so involved with Patagonia and I've read Yvonne's books and I've read The Responsible Company several times, I was very curious to hear what she had to say. And, and the company she was thinking about buying, I said, you know, send me the books. There were no, <laughs> were no books. <laughs> Big red flag. Okay, so I said, well, why don't we start our own, but I'll make you a deal. If we do this, it has got to be the most ethical company we can possibly have our, you know, we could possibly run, which is actually a lot harder than I thought. (laughs) It's very, very, very difficult. Easy to say. It's so easy to say until you actually have to start flying around the world over and over again to find different factories. Anyway, and so we found this material made out of 78% recycled fishing nets from the ocean. Very cool. That's right up my alley. Yeah. Uh, There's just one problem. I don't wear bikinis. Like, I (laughs) have, but I'm not really like a bikini gal. I'm Mm -hmm. not against them. If I had the body to be rocking out bikinis all the time, I probably would, but I'm just not comfortable in a bikini. And so, and she is, but she's not a designer. So we pulled in a third designer and Jessica used to design for O'Neill and Rip Curl and a lot of the big brands. And so we pulled her in as a third. So there's three of us and Jess is the uh, design and Julie's on the ground and I am doing all of the managing money stuff and, and, and just trying to constantly figure out what we're doing with marketing and with branding. So um, that's launching in the next, uh, we should be knock on wood, three weeks. We're also, I should say, wow. two years into factories. We've been to four different factories. It's so hard to find um, decent factories, ethical yeah. factories. I bet. Yeah, and we have a long way to go. I mean, yeah. I'm sure that we could probably do a lot of work on our printing. Um, well, no, that's not true. We're, we're really doing the best we can. I'm pretty proud of our, of our ethics with the company. And we're also 1% for the planet, and we're a B Corp operation nice. as well. So when you say launching in three weeks, you'll have stuff available uh-huh. to market in three weeks? Have you got a URL folks can go to? Yep. So it's locaswimwear.com. So that's L-O-K-A swimwear.com. Uh, we should be able to be up. <coughs> We've got, excuse me, all of our photos done from our shoot in Hawaii. We will be doing pre-orders. Uh, it's not an April Vokey branded company. As an entrepreneur and having owned several, owned and sold and owned and, you know, rerouted several companies in the past, I'm always fascinated by what I can do with my name and my face versus what I can do with just my brain and mm-hmm. my business know-how. And I'm definitely running this one as what can I do with my brain and my know-how. So I'm very curious to see what the what the response is going to be without the company actually having a physical name on it. Right. Yeah. And now your fishing business, what's going on there? Yeah, so I started, I, so I guided for 10 years. I always said I would guide 10 years. I... I after guiding winter steelhead, started guiding winter and summer steelhead, as you know. We met on yes, the bean. Yes, And, uh, yeah, but I always knew I would guide 10 years, and then I wanted to pursue other ventures. And Fly Gal is still running. I do a lot of work with uh, Skeena Spay Lodge up in, in Terrace, so a lot of my clients will reach out to me, or potential clients will reach out, and obviously I set them up with, <coughs> excuse me, Skeena Spay, so I guess that, that would probably call me somewhat of a booking agent. Uh, we still have Fly Owl merchandise, and then, of course, there's still the stuff that I do personally, so the teaching, filming, writing, all the stuff that falls under the um, umbrella branch of FGV Marketers, Inc., which is actually what my company is. Fly Gal Ventures is just a branch of FGV Marketers, Inc. And I, I sat in and witnessed one of your uh, spay clinics. Thank you, by today. the way. Absolutely, and it was it was a wonderful, and I would encourage you, if, if any of you are thinking about some spay instruction or if you have an organization or a group you'd like to do a great team building exercise for 
it would be well worth considering. I was Thank very you. impressed with how you handled it. You're a great teacher. I appreciate that. Thank you. So now that we, we have all <coughs> of that picture of April and all the many irons you have in the fire, um, when you're while you're up in BC in the mm. summer, could you give us a description <laughs> of your average day? Yeah. Well, if all of those, um, I, what do we call it, irons in the fire, uh-huh. went on 365 days a year, I would die. i think i just go insane um i need time for myself to regroup and ground myself you know you'll actually physically see me out there even when i used to guide i don't know if you ever saw this or if you ever took the time to see but i'll just stop and i'll literally bend over and just put my hands on the rocks and close my eyes i just have to ground (laughs) myself to get back and that's what i do do you do that too no but i may have seen (laughs) you do that because the day that we met on a gravel bar on the dean you had two clients that were an absolute handful and (laughs) i just remember thinking oh my god i would shoot myself if i had to guide these two guys yeah (laughs) (laughs) they're probably listening and i don't but anyway it was that we did the 10 years and after 10 years that was that that's all i'm gonna say that's all i'm gonna say but uh yeah so i better ground myself and um because you will lose yourself you know if you're too ambitious which isn't bad especially if you're ambitious to do great things but if you don't keep yourself healthy you can't keep anybody else healthy right so you're qualifying that let's just start with give us a brief description of the house in bc i uh bought 20 acres on the bulkley river some time back five years ago back and uh Started by just bringing up my trailer there, and and then I showed you my wall tent. So I built a mm-hmm. wall tent up there. Well, that's right. The following year, I met my husband, brought him up, and we had built a wall tent together, and we're very proud of it. Put in you know a, a, a permanent fixtured floor, and I laid hardwood and put in these walls. And anyway, two years later, it came crashing down. So since uh, in an ice storm, which was to be expected, so it wasn't a big shock. Uh, so then we built up like a little shack thing. Uh, he likes to call it a cabin, but I like to be realistic. It's a shack. It's lovely. Yeah, thank you. I love it. It's, it's my favorite place on it's Earth. It's modest, but lovely. <laughs> it is. It's modest, but it's mine. You know, it's modest, but it's mine. And um, so I spend from end of June, July, August, September, and as much of October as I can handle up there. And, and to be clear, it's one room. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it has no electricity. No, hell it no. It is heated with a wood stove. Yes, I have to go down to the river every morning and pump my water. You cook your meals over a fire. Uh huh. I shower once a week at the trucker stop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally serious. So if you run yeah. into me in the on the Bulkley and or if you run into me in general up north and I smell funny, that's probably why. <laughs> uh, and when it's sunny out, sometimes I'll manage to get a river shower, you know, river bathe in, but it's usually pretty quick. And my life is really, really simple up there. My, I mean, most of my day, honestly, and I explain. So I'll outline my days for people. So I wake up every morning. And Colby and I cuddle. And that's that's important. It's important because it gets me started. As you know, because you're a dog lover as right. well. Right. I was going to say, give, tell them who Colby is. My dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we, you know, I wake up every morning. Colby and I have our cuddle. And then I go out. And the beautiful thing about where I'm on at on the river is that unless you have a jet boat and you're willing to come up in the pitch black, you're not going to beat me on the river. So I, I get out there and I cast before anybody sees me and before I see anybody. That way it doesn't ruin their day when they get to the spot and they see me. And they don't ruin my day by me having to see them. I finish my fishing in the morning. I go back in. I usually start a fire of some sort. Uh, and then I take my boat and I go into the woods. Or I drive up into this. this I've got a, like a, a back road section of, um, of like, um, what are they called? Uh, like forestry roads. Mm-hmm. And I bow hunt for grouse. And then I go and I either fall a tree or I find a tree that's already been taken down. And I buck it up, throw it in the truck, bring it back. And then I've got to continue bucking and splitting. This goes on until like 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. By that time I'm hungry, I eat. <laughs> if this is sounding pretty simple right now, it's because it is. That's the whole point of it. And then I fish so, the evening. I'll just pause here for a second <laughs> sure. and say, if you're ever one of those people that thought that April Vokey took advantage of her femininity, she cuts down a tree every fucking day. <laughs> well, I don't cut <laughs> <laughs> I may not cut Seriously. one every day. <laughs> but I buck every day. Because here's the thing is, I have to stock because come September 1st, my place is like a freaking parade. There are people, I mean, there's literally, there, there's a campfire going from start to finish. It, do, do I like it? Not necessarily. But yeah, I'm stalking all year for sure. Yeah. And and 
and I need to grid. I mean, I don't know if you didn't know anything about firewood, but you need to grid all your wood, dry it out. Like there's a lot of preparation yeah. and pumping your water. I mean, that takes a big part of being you know, a part of your day. And right. I don't know if you bow hunt for grouse, but that takes no. a big part of your day. No. So, but you're living off land. You are foraging or killing all of your food. Depends. So sometimes like in September and October, when it starts to get cold, I start to bulk up because I end up going out with friends into the pub or, you know, or, or we do a ton of barbecues at my place. So yeah. people will bring over steaks or they'll bring over sausages or we have, you know, little, you know, uh, parties. They're not parties, they're barbecues. Yeah, sure. So when I get up there in the summer, though, I usually try to do some sort of like a cleanse. I'm going to see if I can do it this year. <coughs> Excuse me. It's going to be harder with the, with the baby because I am pregnant. I need to be careful, but... I was telling you last year that for a month I lived off of just the land. So rainbow trout, because there's a lake. How cool is it? Just 10 minutes down the road, there's a lake full of trout. Yeah. And uh, so just trout. And then I've got a bunch of mushrooms on my hunting road and on the property. And then obviously the grouse are fantastic. Uh, sometimes I get salmon. My neighbors keep me pretty pretty fed with salmon. Um, sometimes we get game meat. I haven't hunted any game yet because season opens September 1st. And I'm usually uh, too busy um in the season at that mm-hmm. time of year that's going to be changing soon i'm sure and yeah and just living off berries and everything gets held and 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 rose hips and like i said i just bought this boreal book and it's all about how to live off or how to you know utilize stinging nettle and, and different things that you would never think to use in your in your day-to-day diet so so to get to this kind of minimalist lifestyle, did this require some sort of purge for you? Or was this always an aesthetic that you... Because I saw the pictures of the inside of the house and there's nothing there. <laughs> no. <laughs> there's a bed and there's a stove and I've got my pictures on... Not my pictures, but pictures of things that mean a lot to me on the wall. And um, You know, it's not minimalistic enough. Because I would be a total hypocrite to be like, I am minimalistic. I live in an airplane... My second home is in Manly Beach, Australia. <laughs> I wear a fancy watch. You know, I'm like, I'm not minimalistic. There's no way. I've got eyelash extensions. I cannot be possibly, <laughs> I cannot possibly be minimalistic. That's what I mean. It's just contradictions everywhere you Of course. You turn. And for me to sit here, and worse than that, if I were to say I was a minimalist, I'd be a hypocrite. <laughs> so we're not going to go down that road. But it's as minimalist as I can give myself at this particular stage in my life. I'll be honest with you. You know, it's it's cool that it's fascinating. It's cool that it's fascinating to other people. But it's and it's cool to me too. But it's still not enough. My original goal, Lewis, was I wanted to buy that property and I wanted to build a cabin off of it with the lumber on my property. Ends up, you really can't build that much with poplar. Okay, so yeah. I'm kind of stuck there. Uh, but I wanted to build this cabin and I wanted to disappear and just live off the land for a year. And I wanted to be bow hunting all of these deer and moose and. I haven't been able to do that. I can't spend more than four or five months at a time. And it's not minimalistic. I still have to sit around the campfire and sink my, my like, put my dad, my, my what's it called, the hot spotting on my phone yeah. to get work done. And I still have to be bothered by emails. And, and I still have to, you know, go back to Manly Beach, which is a major shock to my system. So it's not minimalistic enough, but and it's the best. And soon you're going to have a little person there. Yeah, with and that's going to. Oh God, you're scaring me. <laughs> <laughs> because I've been working all of this time to make it so I could finally just like disappear and be that bush woman. Yeah. I have this picture right now of you killing and dressing an elk with a with a bow with a child on your back and a little leather. <laughs> it would be great. It would be super cool. And I and I haven't been able to to kill a uh, an elk yet. And and actually, unfortunately, I wanted to really focus on big game this year because I finally feel ready. Yeah. I didn't feel ready last year. I was so focused on on grouse hunting because you got a tiny target and and I've set up this whole archery range at my place. You haven't mm-hmm. seen that, but I've got this entire archery range at my place awesome. in, in the hill and in the mountain there. And and I do a lot of practice, but I haven't been able to feel confident enough to go for large game until recently, um, like the end of last year in Australia. And now that I've been hunting in Australia I feel ready in BC but I'm not going to be in town long enough in BC this year Mm -hmm. to justify shooting an animal and if I can't shoot an animal and know that I'm going to utilize every inch of it Mm -hmm. I will not pull the trigger sure so I'll be getting my first deer or or stay in Australia I'm afraid Yeah. yeah but yeah it's scary this whole kid thing is really scary you know but um it 
Yeah, it's scary. It's I never did get yeah. to get. I was thinking about that the other day. I was actually kind of sad about it. I was like, I'm never gonna get to do that. I've worked so hard to get to the point where I could, like, Flygal does. It runs itself, and Loka's got the two business partners, and they're really supportive of me being gone all the time. And I was working so hard to get to the point. Like that's why I stopped guiding, and I just and and making it so my face isn't as recognizable. I stopped doing television and doing the podcast, so people don't really know what I look like as much. I hope, <laughs> you know, and making sure my Instagram is not one of those narcissistic accounts where it's just all <laughs> selfies and shit. And so I was working so hard to make it so I could just disappear in the bush, and then I had to go and get myself knocked up. Just in case you were curious, she looks great pregnant. Oh, thank you. I actually look a Kardashian, like a Kardashian. We can all agree on that. But it's hard. It'll work out. But it was, you know, Charles and I had spoke about it in New Zealand this year. We said, you know, we it's time. Charles is 45. I'm 34. Yeah. We're at the point where we have everything that we both want. And mm-hmm. I was feeling a little bit empty, Lewis. Like I was putting all of this energy into the industry and it just wasn't coming back at me. And mm-hmm. I just have all of this love to give and I wanted to adopt a two-year-old, you know, and Charles wanted to have one and so we compromised. We compromised and had a baby, right? <laughs> so, but yeah, so we, um, so I feel in my gut this is the right decision, but selfishly I'm a little sad. I never did get to do the min- minimalistic thing for the year like I wanted to, but I'm sure that I will. I will one day. Maybe sooner than you think. I, I hope so. I, I mean, I think you kind of have the modern woman's dilemma, right? You know, how do you have it all, right? How do you have the baby and the career and the life in the woods? But then you look you know? at it and you really go, because I think about that all the time. You know, it's like I think about the philosophical side of that. And is it having it all? Because pretty sure in all of our history, that has never really existed. I mean, apart from like Game of Thrones time when you're trying to, you know, run a family <laughs> and, and run a, you know, a royal operation... Really, it's not that natural to have a family and a child and a career and all of that. I, I, I don't know. It's a philosophical debate that I constantly struggle with. Well, if anybody's going to pull it off, Khaleesi, it's going to be you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So let's talk a little bit about fishing. You, <laughs> sure. You've been fortunate to fish a lot of pretty wonderful places. And although people picture you with a two-hand rod mm-hmm. and, a, and a steelhead, um, you've done a whole lot more than that. Um, what are some of your favorite uh, destinations and species that you fish for? Oh, good question. As long as you don't ask me what my favorite five weight is after, I'll answer this. No, I really don't care. Okay, good. <laughs> um, <laughs> BC is obviously going to always be my first. Eastern, I'm sorry, Western Australia mm-hmm. is incredible. So now that I've got the two home ones out of the way. Yeah. Uh, the other ones, it, a lot of it depends on my mood. I love Atlantic salmon fishing because they're so beautifully torturous oh, and yeah. horrible to oh, me. Yeah. Um, oh, the Bolivian Golden Dorado. Oh, yeah. It is so unbelievable. Holy smoke. Is the Dorado not the most amazing fish? It's unbelievable. Yeah. And especially when you can go up, you know, into the headboard. Excuse me. Go into, go upstream of, of a river, mm-hmm. into the crystal clear part of the river, and be sight fishing to these things, and they're they're just smashing your fly. And you're... Yeah. I gotta tell you, the first about six Dorado I caught, it scared the hell out of me when they ate right? the fly. Yeah, so uh, aggressive. Where were you when you went? In Argentina on right. the Upper Parana River. Yeah. Okay, aren't they the most frightening things you've ever seen? Oh yeah, oh yeah. They're crazy. Just unchecked aggression. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I love those, depending on my mood. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do like New Zealand brown trout, which is very strange mm. to hear me say that because they're probably the only. It's probably the only fishery that's not indigenous that gets me excited. Mm-hmm. And that's not a mental thing. I just, for some reason, there's something that's not as exciting to me if it hasn't been there for a really long time. But they get me excited. Um, I'm just kind of, let me just quickly in my head draw the map of the world. Atlantic salmon. <laughs> Steelhead. Permit. Destroy my life. Oh. Doesn't matter yeah. where they can, are. Can we just have a little cry? For, yeah. Just take a moment, <laughs> a moment of silence just to think about all of aren't our they, permit. Aren't they wonderful and terrible? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay marlin oh holy smoke now that's something i've never done tell they're, us about that they're ruining my life yeah. they're probably the biggest breach of uh, breach of integrity i've ever had definitely they're the most selfish thing i've ever done selfish they, out do you know how much fuel it takes oh yeah yeah i guess it does yeah um i can justify a lot of my flights i have a hard time justifying a lot of my marlin uh pursuit um 
I'm aware of it. I limit it. Charles and I, are tr- we try to be very responsible. I try to get to the free swimmers as best as I can. I haven't been that lucky yet. Um, but they're probably top of my list right now. Yeah. I've put yeah. in a lot of work trying to get a marlin now. I've, I've hooked marlin. I haven't landed one. Yeah. 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 So marlin. What does it feel like to hook a marlin? Um, the most terrifying fishing experience of your life. <laughs> Imagine the Golden Dorado at 300 pounds. Yeah. Wow. That's it. And they don't don't come up 100 feet behind you. They come up 20 feet behind you. You're looking at their tonsils when they eat, right? Yeah. And that enormous weapon that's attached to their yeah. face. And they've got these huge eyes. And they look at you. And they are lit up in colors that <laughs> are just so warrior and unnatural. Oh. And just, yeah, unnatural, really. It's crazy. Amazing. Mm-hmm. Oh, that sounds cool. Yeah. So... <coughs> I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that you have probably spent most of your life, as far as species are concerned, fishing for steelhead. Yes. And not by accident. That fish, I know, is special to you. Very special to me. Um, Can you talk just a little bit about why you love that fish so much? Sure, I can. They're wild. They're really wild. It sounds so corny for me to be like, they're wild, just like I am. But they really are. And you have to, I mean, now that you've heard my timeline, go back to that 16-year-old girl who was really lost and confused and just unsure and in the wild trying to find myself. And when I was out there trying to find myself, I found them. And so I just associate them with something so strong and independent. And that's just never left. It just so happens that they are strong and independent. Their entire life cycle is incredible. Um, but they're also, I mean, just their name is endearing, isn't mm-hmm. it? Like a steelhead. Yeah. Um, and they're just, every, I think it's that every single steelhead I've ever caught has, it's never been unappreciated. I've caught brown mm-hmm. trout and been like, oh God, just like get off my line. Or I've caught species and uh, apart from like permit and, you know, fish like that. Sometimes it's not, they're not that appreciated, I guess. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? You take them for granted. But every single steelhead is so perfect that I just, yeah. Yeah. I can't, I'm having a hard time putting it into words. I just feel, I just feel a connection to the steelhead. Yeah. And always have, yeah. So, have you given any thought um, to when <laughs> and how you'll teach your child to fish? Yes. I put a lot of thought into this. And it's embarrassing. It's one of those things where it's uncomfortable to talk about because anybody who has children has an opinion. And I don't have children, so I'm not allowed to have opinions. <laughs> you, you have a child, actually. I, I can see it from here. I do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's a small one right now, but it's there. You know, I just, I, I don't want to say, look, I'm going to tread carefully here. I listen to the stories. That does not mean I want my inbox full of opinions, please. (laughs) Okay. If I would like an opinion, I will ask for it. But I listen to the stories and opinions of people around me who I love and I respect. And and most importantly, whose children I have watched grow up. It's the most Mm -hmm. important thing. So it's not that I don't want your email because I don't care about you and your family. I just, if I haven't met your child... And we don't know each other, please. You have to understand, there's 10 million opinions coming at me at once. Oh, with this yeah, baby. no, yes. And, um, <laughs> and I'm just not that person who's polite enough to be like, oh, great, thank you. Would you like to rub my belly while you're at it? Like, <laughs> I'm just not that person. I have a group of friends and family, and I'll be listening to them. And so I've watched them because, again, they're like minded. And a lot of them did it by keeping it hard to get. And somebody mm-hmm. said to me, actually, somebody I really respect, um, said to me you know you're putting too much thought into it and he might be right but at the same time I mean can you really put too much thought into this stuff I don't know because I guess you can't control what direction you're going to go but I can say that I've met a lot of people whose kids hate fishing because they were it was pushed on them and I've met a lot of kids who love fishing because their parents kind of made it hard not hard to get but not as accessible as maybe others have does that make sense? Yeah, sure. So I think there's going to be a little bit of, oh, sorry, you can't come out with me yet. Or, you know, you can only come out for, I don't know, Lewis. I don't know. It depends so much on the personality. <laughs> I'll, I will play it by ear. But what I can tell you for sure is I will not be pushing it on them. It's really, really important. Because like, my dad's one of the best guitar players I've ever seen. Mm. He is such a beautiful guitar player. And he's also a luthier. I mean, he builds guitars. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, he's amazing. And... Um, 
there was always so much pressure whenever I would try to learn, not on, not on purpose, but he never pressured me to learn. But when I did try to learn, it was I felt this pressure to be so good because of how good he was that it put me off of it. And mm-hmm. That's why I kind of turned to vocals instead. But yeah, yeah, I don't know. I really don't know how I'm going to handle it. I think just no pressure. And I know for sure that the two things I'm going to avoid are the cold and the early mornings. A hundred percent. Because I don't know anybody who enjoys, like any any child who enjoys the cold or the early mornings. Sure. In my yeah. circle, anyway. Yeah. So we've, we've covered a lot of territory here. Is there anything glaring for you that we've missed? Oh, sorry. Jesus. I feel like all I've done is ramble. And you no, know, this has been an amazing conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> It's so exciting to have somebody listen. So it's just like I talk a mile a minute. The past, um, yeah, you know, I, I meet a lot of people who are like, oh, we don't want your past getting out or, you know, you wouldn't want to share your past. Like, you know, I think that that's something, like I, I do a lot of motivational speaking in schools. Mm-hmm. And actually I do some work with one of the schools in Chicago yeah. with a lot of the inner city kids uh, who <coughs> maybe have been in a similar up upbringing to what I was in and when we speak on Skype calls they don't want to talk to me about about fishing they want to talk to me about how I was able to become successful when things weren't looking up for me I would say don't be hiding you know don't hide your past I'm not going to hide my past anymore because I think that it can do more good than than uh than not so there's, there's that, because I don't think a lot of people know about my past. There's obviously, I mean, we missed a huge part of the timeline, but that's I'm quite all right by that, because mm-hmm. we don't have that much time. Um, so I'm curious, you've accomplished such a great deal. Is there any big goal out there yet that you, you've really got your eye on? Is there something that, is it a, is it a um, conservation thing? Is it a fish you want to catch? Is it a place you want to be? <laughs> or Yeah. Yeah, uh, this child, Mm -hmm. to see that I can do this and still live that kind of life that I aspire to live. And that that year of just disappearing, that year that we were speaking about, that Mm -hmm. there's always conservation issues. I can't just give you one right now because it's it's just, it's never ending. Uh, But yeah, probably those two big things. And I think that's a great goal. Yeah. To take to take that year and check out, and if it's just you or if it's you and your child, yeah, I think that'll be wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time um, to thank sit you. down and and let folks get to know you because I certainly enjoy knowing you, and I think they will as well. And um, once again, I can't thank you enough um, for coming here to Atlanta um, and helping us with our issues on the Chattahoochee. Thank you so much for that. Thank you very much for inviting uh, me. And great travels back to your little paradise in BC. <laughs> thank you.